Extinctions are one of the main problems of the globalized world. Ecosystems are suffering the loss of many species, and those that are left are becoming ever rarer. Of the groups of animals being most affected is that of the large predators. In South America, jaguars have lost huge areas of their territories, and the process continues. Scientists calculate that in Argentina, less than 200 remain in the wild. In spite of its being a powerful and emblematic animal, everything points to the fact that they are on the verge of extinction. During the last decade, several researchers are working on getting to know the species better for the purpose of conservation. Meanwhile, jaguars from northern Argentina are fighting a fierce but unequal struggle to survive on this last frontier. The jaguar's last frontier. We know in certain detail about the extinction of many species around the world. However, the history of jaguars in Argentina is virtually unknown. In fact, many people don't even know that the species is found in the country. The presence of jaguars in the country is clearly documented. From naturalists and travelers of the 19th century, through place names such as Nahuel Huapi, Tiger Lake, the Tigre at the delta source of the River Plate, and especially in San Luis province, where we least expect jaguars, there are over 15 places with its name. It is firmly represented on the map of Argentina. Even so, we have pushed its memory back to such an extent that many people don't even know that in their province there were jaguars once upon a time. So once it has disappeared, it is erased from our memory, out of our thoughts. An extinction from our memory is the worst kind of extinction. Around the year 1900, its range stretched from southern United States to our Colorado River, at some 40 degrees latitude south. In barely a hundred years, its distribution was reduced to less than half in Argentina, where today only three small populations survive. In Misiones province, northeast corner of the country, in the Chaco region, north central Argentina, and in the cloud forests of the northwest. The jaguars of Misiones live in the subtropical forest, our most biodiverse habitat, which during the 20th century was reduced in area by some 70%. As the forest disappeared, it was hard to establish just how many jaguars were left. Using radio telemetry, the Brazilian biologist Peter Croshaw, in the 1980s decade, and including neighboring Brazil, calculated that there were three to five hundred jaguars. However, twenty years later, the situation of these forests had changed radically. Around 2002, biologist Agustin Paviolo started work to try to answer two questions. How many jaguars were left and where? Agustin had a tool that Peter lacked camera traps. These detect a passing animal and take its picture. Their use changed the way to study mammals. After 150 kilometers of trails were opened up and planting dozens of these cameras, Agustin and his team collected the first samples in South America using this technology. The cameras started to show the jaguars of Misiones. By comparing the pattern of spots, Agustin could initially identify 14 individuals in what was left of the forest. But as data was added, so his worries grew. We started to note that the density of animals had dropped drastically since the 1990s. His results showed that the whole Misiones population of jaguars did not reach 50 individuals. This was surely a red light. 
It really shook us because we were talking about a very, very small population. Small populations are hardly viable in the long run. Endogamy from a small gene pool increasingly weakens the population. Further, the areas of forest that remain are ever more isolated, which impedes the animals meeting. This is an enormous problem for their conservation. The smaller the population, the less possibility there is of a viable number through time. We are in a situation where the real risk of extinction of the species in Misiones is high, very high. With few animals in a fragmented habitat, the biologists needed to know just how the jaguars used it, the basic data for their protection. For this, they needed to catch a jaguar and put a collar on it, which allows for following its movements. Nagustin set up several traps in Iguazu National Park. When the animal treads on the appointed place, a noose closes around its foot. This depends on a very careful setting of traps. This must be very free of leaf litter, as it must close extremely fast. And when the trap closes, a cell phone message is sent automatically. So Agustin and his team of veterinarians can arrive promptly. Several days later, a male they named Guacurari was caught. He was known from photographs from three years back. The team put GPS collar on him, which records exactly the animal's position and which could be traced by radio. Straight away, the collar on Guacurari started to give data on his movements. Later, he would become the emblem of the protection of Misiones Jaguars. The Jaguars of Mission is a few, but their situation is known. To find out what's happening to the ones in the Chaco, one has to paddle a canoe 120 kilometers. Veronica Quiroga and Gabriel Boaglio cross the impenetrable Chaco area, as it is known, by descending the Bermejo River. They are privileged to be in one of the last sanctuaries of Chaco woods. For a long time, it was thought that the Chaco Jaguars were numerous. Lack of data fed this belief. At the beginning of the 2000 AD decade, Veronica started work in Copo National Park, some 400 kilometers south of here. At that time, it was still easy to find Jaguar tracks. You still smell Jaguar on the trails. Quite incredible. People still told of cattle predation. You talked to them and the data was spot on. The species was still in the area. A few years later, Veronica enlarged her study area to include a major part of the Chaco region. She set up dozens of camera traps and for months covered the region searching for jaguars, but she never got the results she expected. It is now five years that we have been working with camera traps in different places and have no to one photo to show for it. Yes, for we have seen very few. And for example, in Copo National Park, not even sport in spite of it being the area where most of our effort was made. The myth of jaguars being plentiful was a fable. She analyzed thousands of photographs, not one showed a jaguar to be around. When you start to evaluate that that one photo is missing, you really worry, realizing that you are unearthing the truth about an area that you don't want to tell anyone. The reason that the Chaco Jaguars vanished pitilessly appeared, as well as decades of persecution and shooting, deforestation for agriculture and cattle had been added over the last 15 years. At present, there are very few individuals in this habitat and that area yearly becomes more scarce and fragmented. The history of other regions of the country is being repeated now. 
in the Chaco impenetrable region. The few nucleus areas with fine woods left in the Chaco region are becoming ever more disconnected from one each other. Neither are they connected with other areas where there are other jaguars that makes the population ever more vulnerable. The lack of jaguars, as well as indicating their likely extinction, is also a conservation problem for the whole ecosystem. When a large predator disappears, the numbers of certain herbivores increases, as also of medium-sized predators that end up affecting other species. A predator like the jaguar is necessary to keep the ecosystem working well. And this is not the situation in the Argentine Chaco. Veronica calculated that in Argentina's Chaco region, there are less than 20 jaguars. However, she's full of hope on this expedition. The stretch of the Bermejo River flows through an enormous estancia called La Fidelidad, 250,000 hectares of well-preserved woods. It's one of the best places in the whole region. A month ago, she and her team installed several camera traps to try and get pictures of a jaguar. Veronica believes that if there are any jaguars left, they must be here. In three days' time, she will know. From his studio in Buenos Aires, Aldo Chape, the artist, is about to start a one-way trip towards jaguar privacy. The canvas is an infinity of possible images of a jaguar. The first rough lines are already defining its future. Aldo's work is solitary, and each painting he starts seems like a battle against old modesties. The lines are barely a technicality, a gesture presaging its destiny. In Aldo's hands, a simple pencil becomes a powerful instrument at the service of beauty. The female is allowing herself to be seen, while her cubs are merely outlined to convey proportional perspective. The spots escape from the graphite and give Aldo's jaguar her shape. However, as these animals become alive, Argentina's jaguars seem irremediably condemned to disappear. It would be wrong to think that jaguars are disappearing for only one reason. Usually a species vanishes, especially in present times, as if in a chess game, where one threat calls check, another adds its check, and so little by little we close a game with a checkmate. This is what happened to the jaguar in the face of settlement of its territories. That is the land that belonged to the species, as man took them over. Where man settled, he modified the habitat by logging, clearing with fire. Conflicts arose as they brought in cattle and as the jaguar had less habitat, so there is less prey, and of necessity he preys on domestic cattle. Man will not allow this, and so turns to persecution of the species by hunting, trapping, and through various methods we have exterminated it. The transformation of the plains and the advance of the agro-frontier into wooded regions the conflict over domestic cattle and poaching were determining factors in the disappearance of the big cats. The hunting of jaguars has been forbidden for many years, but it's still frequent. The Jaguarete Network investigates poaching and searches for captive specimens. Its activities have led to the discovery of dozens of illegal pelts and provided information for the justice system to take action. In other cases, it's the cattle breeders who harass the jaguars in defense of their cattle. This brings us to the population of the most enigmatic jaguars in Argentina. The jungas, which are mountain cloud forests, extend south from Bolivia. A broken mountain habitat and its difficult access for man is home to the greatest concentration of jaguars in Argentina, 
which represents a problem for settlers. Baritu is a locality on the edge of Baritu National Park. The inhabitants practice subsistence agriculture under traditional methods. In this fragile economy, there's no room for waste. Each and every grain is of value. Families also have a few cows, which spend a lot of the time in the forest. And this is where conflict begins. Jaguars prey on calves and the settler might lose his animals, all his capital, in a season. Here at home, just 300 yards away, it killed a calf, right now in summer. About 12 calves a year. That is what the jaguar takes. He hunted eight calves of my dad's. That was he lost everything he was producing. Only a few days ago, a mauled calf was found just six kilometers from Baritu. I went searching for it, and there it was wounded. Its mother saved it. She is fierce. Now biologist Pablo Peroic wants to see the wounds. No doubt they were done by a jaguar. The croup shows the claw marks. The withers show a huge bite. These are evidence of how the cat attacks. Honorato Regis is worried. This time he's been lucky. The calf may well survive with care. But Pablo knows that these attacks unnerve the settlers. They always proceed a hunt. But they're not allowed to kill the jaguars protected by the national park. For over 20 years, Pablo has been studying and protecting the jaguars of the Jungas cloud forest. He knows that while the people of Baritu have cattle, the jaguars will hunt them. This poses a dilemma for Pablo. How to conserve the jaguars without affecting the economy of the settlers? If he wants to protect the species, he must find an answer to this problem. Jaguars take to cattle when their natural prey is scarce. In a healthy habitat, there's always enough food. Practically any medium or large animal is valid prey. Though they obviously prefer certain species. Capybaras react immediately. Now the jaguar is downwind and the peccaries can't smell it. The jaguar tries a closer approach. The herd always has a straggler easy to catch. It's not always easy to approach it in silence. Peccaries are always alert to sounds. A full-grown jaguar kills every so many intents. He's even able to kill animals with effective defenses, such as giant anteaters or herbivores over 200 kilos in weight, like the tapir. To find out which mammals jaguars kill, biologist Lucia Palacio of the Subtropical Biological Institute does research on the hairs found in droppings. The hairs of each species have a distinguishing characteristic 
when seen under a microscope. And Lucia catalogues the hairs of medium to large mammals of northern Argentina. For each species, she registers the structure of the core and outside cuticle. This data has proved effective for precise identification. With this information, the hairs of victims of jaguars and other carnivores are used to determine the species they came from. Now the scientists will be able to identify just what Guacuradí was hunting in Iguazú while he was being monitored by signals from the collar he wore and get samples for analysis. It was a GPS collar which stored his perambulations and we had to approach him periodically to download remotely all that information through a receptor into a computer. This recovery of the data never worked well. There were some technical difficulties in the transmission which did not allow us to get the information we needed. Wakuradi was well, but the collar didn't work as it should have. Over time, the situation got worse. After nine months' work, we started to miss news of Wakuradi and didn't know where he was and suspected that the collar had been damaged. A few weeks later, we got some news from the camera traps that Wakuradi was wearing his collar so that we knew that the animal was well. We thought that the battery had run down or that the collar had been damaged. Wakurari was still in his territory and Agustin needed to salvage the information. The collar had a gadget to lie, to drop off and still emit a signal so it could be located. However, the collar never dropped and the only alternative the scientist was left with was to recapture the beast. Four traps were set where he had been photographed. Catching him once had been almost an accident. And to repeat it seemed unlikely as it needed all Agustin's skill. Three weeks later, one trap was set off and the team raced to the spot. Luck could not have been more favorable. Wakurari had been recaptured. At once, he was surrounded by a host of silent vets and biologists. They worked expertly. There are not many opportunities like this to collect samples. Agustin recuperated the old collar and put on a new one. He doesn't know whether he can download the information. There were only a few more moments to work before the anesthetic would wear off. And all his attention is on the animal. Little by little, Guacurari comes to and returns to his forest. Agustin cannot imagine how much this animal will change the understanding of the Misiones jaguars. If jaguars were not so persecuted, their numbers might just recover. A female enters Estrus every two years, and for two weeks, she will endure the proximity of her chosen mate. Together they wander the shared territory, and later each will go its separate ways, and after some three and a half months gestation, she will have her litter. The females in a population guarantee the generational interchange and when they appear, all is the centre of attraction. A female emission is called Jacirandi, has her territory in Puerto Peninsula Provincial Park, where Ranger Gabriel San Juan works. In his 30 years of conservation work, Gabriel knows the park's jaguar close up. These are fixed cameras because they have always been jaguars here, in this area, so we have them here constantly to film them. The camera traps allow him to indulge in his two passions, photography and watching nature. 
This is a different camera model for stills or filming. Gabriel has 10 cameras installed in Parque Peninsula. I placed this one a short time ago in a different habitat, lower woods, so one can see just what is moving around within the woods. I do this every 15 days so as not to influence things with my moving about. What I like best is returning to the ranger station to see on the computer what the cards hold, new things appearing. My impatience is impressive. In this way, Gabriel filmed Jasirandi, the great mother cat of Parque Peninsula, for the very first time. Shortly before, Agustin Paviolo had captured a famous photograph of her on heat and with a male in tow. Después de ese celo que fue en el 2008. After her season, which was in 2008, on the 13th of February of 2009, I found her with two cubs, walking here along the inner trail of Puerto Peninsula. This was the first meeting we had with Jasirandi. So we placed the camera traps out on a Saturday, and on Sunday she is filmed standing in front of the camera, showing off her full splendor. The next night, she appears with both her cubs crossing in front of the camera. These were the first two videos we have of her. In five years, Jassi Randi had five offspring in three litters. The films show the cubs as they grow, always followed closely by their mother. The jaguar's recuperation depends on animals like Jassi Randi. In her life, a female can whelp some ten offspring, an important number for returning the balance big predators offer to the forest. Gabriel becomes a privileged witness of Jasirandi's life. For me, Jasirandi is the overindulgent mother. We know her through seeing her spoor every day. The mother of five. Wow, Sam Jagia. Her last pup was named Jessie Day, a strong and healthy female who renews Gabriel's hopes for the future of Jaguars. Jessie Randi also awoke the interest of scientists. On a dark night, Agustin Paviolo and his team managed to trap her. He hopes that she will furnish complementary information to that of the male in Guacuradi. This data may protect her, as it will the rest of the female jaguars of Misiones. From now on, the destiny of Jasirandi will be closely followed. Aldo Chapa's Jaguar is coming to life. Each brushstroke feeds that metabolism, emerging not merely the painting, but also the nameless relationship between the artist and his work. Later it will belong to everybody. But at this moment, it's a mere dialogue, a transformation of pigments into meaning, a happening that changes the canvas and changes the artist. Neither will ever be the same again. Day by day, the scene gains dimension. Female and her cubs start to escape from the artist to live in the changing universe of forms and backgrounds. The strokes are as yet thick, suggesting the embryonic background unfolding in this tribute.
In the laboratory of the Institute of Subtropical Biology, Agustin Paviolo hardly believes what's happening. Wakurari's old collar has performed its purpose. It was sheer joy to find that it was fine and be able to recuperate the information, especially to know that all that effort over two years had been worthwhile. Over nine months, the collar registered Wakurari's position every 30 minutes. Myriads of data to be analyzed. Biologist Carlos De Angelo could now complete the puzzle that kept him busy for years. Wakurari's information is basic to understanding just how jaguars use their habitat. Among the things that we learned about individuals such as Wakurari is that they really move around a lot. Wakurari averaged some nine kilometers a day. Some days he concentrated his activities to a very small area, we suppose when he had killed large prey. Then he would move great distances. We discovered some of up to 25 kilometers in a single day. What is the rhythm of activities? Which habitats do they prefer to move through? How do they disperse? What defines the occupation of a territory? Wakurari answered many of our pending questions, and just to know what a jaguar needs is a key to their conservation. The Misiones jaguars depend on being able to maintain a good area of habitat for one thing. Then the big question is that it be able to survive in that habitat, not shot, reducing the threats of the place. The Misiones forests severely fragmented. The forested area is cut up by small farms and forestry, thus breaking up its continuity. If we have a small population, we are in danger. But further, if the population is split up, or the interchange of individuals is hindered, or if individuals can recolonize areas, it is fundamental that there be habitat interconnections so that jaguars can move freely from one area to another. Carlos has drawn up a map where priority areas are shown. These must be kept connected by suitable habitat to maintain contact between the jaguars. Guacurari provided precious information to save these species, and everyone hoped he would continue to do so. But the new collar broke down in a few days. Agustin and his team lost contact with the jaguar. He had vanished and didn't appear on the camera pictures. Further, the scientists found another male in Guacurari's territory. Agustin feared that the new male had ousted Guacurari towards a dangerous area. As the weeks crawled by, the possibilities of finding him became more remote. During the winter, the clouds descend on the Junga's montane forest. And these provide the humidity that supports all life in the dry season. The peaks appear and vanish while the landscape sinks into a long period of calm. However, the jaguars ambush the cattle and Pablo Perovic's worrying problem is latent. Now he has a solution to benefit both jaguars and settlers, but his idea still has a few problems. Here, cattle are raised without any form of management. And the cows disperse and are brought back when they go too far. This is not compatible with what Pablo has in mind. However, some from Baritu accept his proposal. Pablo's solution is simple. Instead of the settlers persecuting the jaguar, Pablo will try to prevent jaguars killing cattle. If calves are not killed by jaguars, 
there will be no need to organize hunting parties. The idea was to keep young animals, which are at risk, out of danger. Later they could return to the traditional Roman management, keep these young ones out of the jaguar's reach. This nine-hectare corral is the first to be built in Baritu by a group of families who thus protect the calves from being attacked. A simple idea, but to put it into practice was a different story. It was a long job to convince them to start on this type of project. It meant a change from free range without management of cattle and that the objective was that it should be communal effort carried out by all and that it should become theirs. The first results were promising. The families which share the corral have had no big losses recently. An important stimulant for the rest of the settlers. I see it working well in future, but that depends on whether the people accept it as definitely theirs. Pablo knows that there is much to be done. It is the first such project with Jaguars. While the corrals reduce the attacks of cattle, harmonious existence between cat and people may not be too utopian. Pablo's corral protects cattle from Jaguar attacks. In the province of Corrientes, other corrals are being built for a different reason. In the heart of the Ibera marshes, the Conservation Land Trust is building a jaguar breeding center. The idea is that starting with animals from captivity, which cannot now be returned to the wild, their offspring should be conditioned for such release. They will have no contact with humans and could be reintroduced in areas where jaguars have disappeared. Let's think that ecosystems are sometimes like works of art. They suffer deterioration, change over time, but there are also ways for restoration of art. And with captive raised animals, we can contribute towards restoring those habitats. In truth, we don't have many opportunities, nor much time. So it is important that when we think about those captive populations that have no clear purpose, I believe the offspring of those animals as the basis for a project could reinforce or strengthen today's threatened populations of jaguar in the impenetrable Chaco. On their second day of travel, Gabriel Boaglio and Veronica Quiroga collect the first of the cameras they left a month ago. They'd place them near the river where prey activity is greater. The camera is in good shape. Its batteries are still charged. Veronica puts away the memory card to check it at night. Now they must go on to the next camp. The mist seems to bring the Bermejo shores closer with promises of jaguars at every curve. Why does the Fidelidad seem such a good place for the species? It's hardly been exploited. There are no settlers within it. Its woods remain ecologically unchanged, but especially because it holds an enormous quantity of the jaguar's prey species. Now the scientists are witnesses to that. Fifteen white-lipped peccaries are cornered against the cliff by the river. They are seen to be tired, hungry and cold. Some have even died. Veronica and Gabriel try to drive them to the nearest beach. They're surely the remains of a herd which in escaping from hunters tried to cross the river 
and ended up in this trap. They seem to have been here for several days. In but a few minutes, they've left the cliff behind and head for the woods. Now there's no time to lose. The campsite is several kilometers away. Last thing at night, Veronica checks the first photographs. La Fidelidad is rarely full of wildlife. <laughs> Dozens of species have paraded in front of the camera. Tapir con cría, una corzuela, parda, otro tapir. El tigre no, por ahora. However, anxiety turns to anguish as the images flash by and the jaguar does not appear. Their hopes are postponed till tomorrow. Bueno, nada. En el Bermejo, tigre no. So far, Veronica's cameras have not featured the Jaguar. Gabriel San Juan has better luck at Puerto Peninsula. One camera caught Jacirandi again, now wearing the collar placed on her by the scientists. Gabriel follows the female and her last cub closely. Jessie Day, now nearly one year old, keeps her mother company. As part of their routine, both often cross the road that leads to the city of Puerto Iguazu. Historically, these Misiones highways are animal cemeteries. We have had six ocelots, opossums, 10 or 15 each day, foxes, a puma a week ago, here, leave in the park. At this time of the year, pumas are in season, and this happens. In a week or two, foxes come into season. There will be a collection of fox roadkills. A study has registered 289 roadkills in a year, in just 22 kilometers of highway. Animal death on the road is an old problem which is on the rise as tourism to Iguazu National Park increases. Road signs to this effect have not been enough as a preventive measure. People do not become aware simply because of road signs. Radar and speed detectors have also been talked about, fines for speeding, speed reducers in the asphalt. All must be installed eventually, otherwise there is no stopping it. One way to avoid these deaths continuing is that vehicle roads and animal trails should never cross each other. This is what animal crossings under the road try to avoid, as set up by the Conservation Argentina organization. Bridges, tunnels and culverts are animal crossings, avoiding direct contact with the highway. Gradually, the fauna are starting to use them as they become accustomed and more confident. Such animal crossings are set up in many countries. In Argentina, they are starting to work in Misiones, and albeit in an experimental stage, they are growingly successful. But on highways lacking animal crossings, road kills increase yearly. Public attention was captured only when the victim was a jaguar. El 13 de agosto del año pasado estaba con la ventana abierta y escucho un impacto fuerte acá. On August the 13th last year, I had a window open and heard a loud bang here, very near the park's entrance. Not knowing what caused it, I went to see what it was about, thinking that it might even be a person or some large animal. Some 200 yards away from the entrance to the peninsula, I find a smashed-up jaguar.
después del impacto vi pasar un colectivo que no paró. I had seen a bus pass after the bank. It did not stop. So I called the border guards and asked them to stop the bus that had a dent or two, or something smashed, as there were pieces of a fender. The senseless death of a Jaguar was a shock to all. It was something that could have been avoided. With the population decimated by poachers and loss of habitat, now road kills are added. But that was not all the bad news. At that moment, truly, it was smashed up by the impact in such a twisted position. I could tell it was a Jaguar. I couldn't tell its size. There were bits all over the place. In other words, I didn't realize it was Jacitei. Jasirandi's last offspring had been killed and could only be identified by its spots. The mother searched for her lost cub for 10 days. One feels terribly powerless on seeing such an animal smashed up on the road. And this after having seen her walking in the park as a cub. That is, even now I am overcome. It breaks my heart. For the Jacitei incident, the bus company was fined a modest sum, but the situation has not changed in any way. From the air, the surface of Misiones offers a discouraging aspect. There seem to be few areas suitable for Jaguars. Carlos de Angelo is trying to locate Guacurari. A weak radio signal from his collar would have him far from his old territory, which is the first sign of the Jaguar after months. Agustin starts a land search. Kilometers of forest separate him from the spot identified from the air. He's disconcerted because the established point is in the Uruguay Provincial Park. And after three hours hiking, Wakurari's signal can be heard. Everything indicates that they are near the animal but they never expect to see what they found. What was left of Guacurari was the skull, a few bones, and the collar. It was devastating for Agustin and his team. It was a very sad moment, and shocking to find him and realize, well, that he had ended in this way. The remains indicated that he died of a shot wound a few weeks before. To actually realize that what we hear about is really happening, it is now we see that Jaguars are still being killed every year. It's true, and that it should have happened to this individual, which we had been following for over six years, and monitoring him through the camera traps. And so, we have been getting to know what his life was like and he was a really lovely animal. And what one would have hoped for him, if all worked out as it should have, is that these individuals should die of old age. True, isn't it? Wakurari's end is, doubtless, what is happening to the species in Misiones. He never entered into conflict with mankind, but nevertheless ended up being shot within a protected area that exists so that these species should be able to live on. The death of Guacurari did not only cut short research that would help all Jaguars, it also set off a series of indignant protests in various parts of Misiones. Under the slogan, the forest is in mourning, the Atlantic Forest Research Center 
the Argentine Wildlife Foundation, the Forest Bank, and other organizations showed their indignation at the policies of poaching control and about the lack of attention in the protected areas of Misiones. What is clear is that in Misiones there is no adequate protection for jaguars. As this happened in one of the provinces with the largest number of protected areas, what can one expect for the Chaco region? The canoeists were reaching the last camera trap at the end of their expedition. If there is any hope to be found in La Fidelidad, it is in the one jaguar footprint found around here by Veronica, Gabriel and two volunteers on their previous expedition. Finding the spore was like a relief, like being able to say that it's hope and still might turn up. However, the hopes were shattered when they went through the photographs in the last camera. Unfortunately, it still had not made an appearance in the last photo. We have active cameras and are changing them about, taking them to places where we think there is more likelihood that the species could appear, to see just what is happening. Evidently, the density of this species is also very sparse, and in spite of the habitat and abundant prey, it has still not shown up. The Bermejo River flows silently across the impenetrable. It's sleeping giant that wakes up with the summer rains when waters are loaded with tree trunks rushing by, molding the Fidelidad's shores. Perhaps they will awaken the other giant, the one that hides in the winter mist as if to say farewell to the woods. Aldo Chiapo's painting is nearly ready. The aesthetic act that reflects the vision affirms the magic that holds on to the canvas. Aldo approaches the world through his naturalist's soul and herein lies the essence of his art. With each painting he creates, forever, the vision of a man who evokes lost nature. His talent extends a bond that returns to man in visible beauty. The canvas no longer exists. Now it is a closed world, complete, an instant in the life of its characters. The female that has chatted with Aldo is predicting the return to innocence. Her pups will not be run over, will not be shot, and will always have a prodigious forest to defend them. She is saying that the jaguar's extinction means the end of a dehumanized society. However, perhaps all is not lost. In Misiones, they are working on a plan to protect the species, and if they reduce road kills and poaching, it's just possible to believe in a viable population. In the jungas, cloud forests, settlers and the jaguars are learning to live together. The one paw print found in La Fidelidad tells us that there are still jaguars living in the Chaco region. Creating a protected area in these lands means conserving an exceptional region. And perhaps jaguars born in Ibera may be able to reinforce this persecuted population. With the national park in the Impenetrable, not only the jaguar will be protected, but the whole ecosystem which is quickly being reduced. The history of jaguar in Argentina is at a crossroads it may end up saving the species, the ecosystem, and in some vigorous way, 
the relationship between humans and nature. Or it may become the history of the inevitable extinction, in the history of lost ethics, entrenched in values of false humanism.